Welcome. Today we are joined by three members of the creative team of Yamanja, a new musical theater piece which will have its 2022 premiere at Mass MoCA and tour internationally. Yamanja is anchored by songs performed by Angelique Kiju, backed by a live band, a chorus of dancers and singers, actors, and a visual design by Carrie James Marshall. The musical director is Daryl Archibald, whose numerous Broadway credits include the 2015 revival of The Color Purple and Motown the Musical. Kijo's magnetic presence and captivating music are the powerful vessels to contain and deliver the story, a work of magical realism that illuminates through song what happens when people are robbed of their culture. Written by Naima Hebral Kijo and directed by Cheryl Lynn Bruce, the story is at once uniquely African and reverberates with deep connections to the roots of American African culture. Its universal themes are love, betrayal, honor, free will, as well as the horror and justice of slavery. Today, we meet the creative team midway on their journey to discuss their creative process. In addition to Angelique Kijo, Cheryl, and Naima, the visual team working on this project is Carrie James Marshall, visual design, Kathy Perkins, lighting design, Rasan Devante Johnson, production design, and myself as costume designer. Imanja is produced by Rachel Chanoff's Office Arts. Let me introduce the three amazing women behind this project. Angelique Kijo is a global pop star and three-time Grammy Award winner and an international creative force. Her striking voice and stage presence and fluency in multiple cultures have expanded her following across national borders. Kiju has cross-pollinated the West African tradition of her childhood with elements of American R&B, funk, jazz, and influences from Europe and Latin America. Kiju received the 2015 Crystal Award given by the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and the 2016 Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscious Award. She takes time to join us today from her international tour of her newly released album, Mother Earth. Naima Hebral Kijo, a recent transplant to LA, is a franco beninese actress and playwright who grew up in Brooklyn. She graduated from the school at Steppenwolf and received a BA from Yale University, where her play, Pixel Souls, won the Berkeley College Arts Prize. She has acted in numerous theatrical productions as well as on TV. Cheryl Lynn Bruce is a veteran director, writer, and performer, and has staged productions for Victory Gardens Theater, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, University of Illinois, Indiana University, and the Creative Arts Foundation, among many others. She also developed and directed Carrie James Marshall's Bunraku-influenced urban comic Rhythm Master for the Wexner Center for the Arts in 2008. She received the African American Arts and Black Theater Alliance Best Direction Awards for From the Mississippi Delta and a Joseph Jefferson nomination for her direction of August Wilson's Jitney, both Congo Square Theater productions. Other recognitions include the Illinois Public Humanities Award, the Robert Rauschenberg Residency, a Yale Art Gallery Residency, and the Jane Addams Cole House Woman of Valor Award in 2010. So welcome Angelique, Cheryl, and Naima uh, to Guildhall. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, 
we're, you know, we're gonna start a little bit talking about the concept and the genesis of the project. So I wanna turn to our writer first, Naima, um, because that's what she does is set the stage for the story. So if you could just set the stage um, for us in the audience, um, the story of Yamanja, um, the historical players, the spiritual players, what, you know, um, just tell us a little bit about that. Of course, yeah. So the, the story originated um, a while back with my mom, the glorious Angelique Kijo, who it was kind of a journey trying to, to weave together parts of her life, um, parts of the Yoruba tradition and her life today. So really the story of Yamonja is, and we'll, we'll talk about this more, I'm sure, is bridging kind of the, the traditional the past and the present. So Yamanja is an Orisha, which is in the Yoruba tradition, religion, and people is um, a deity. And she's the deity of water, of fertility. She looks over soulmates. She looks over mothers. Um, and so there's a historical aspect to this Orisha. Um, and then we're setting the stage here, this play happens in um, Wida or Daome at the time, which is modern day Benin during the slave trade in the 1800s. So we've got these two worlds that on paper seem kind of at odds. We think of the slave trade and um, the brutality of that. And then kind of the, the deep rooted tradition and beauty of Yamanja and the Orishas. And we're kind of putting them together um, and Yamanja, played by Angelique, is uh, our guide on this story. She takes us on this story, telling us and singing us through the past in, in an attempt to, to bridge differences. You know, if the people during this time can bridge together, today we could all be bridging together. So there's a lot of characters that are based on um, real life historical figures like you were asking about. Um, we have King Akaba who's kind of lurking in the background who is um, who is based on a on a Beninese king who was engaging kind of in commerce with the slavers. Our main slaver character De Salta is also based on a Portuguese slaver that existed in history. So we're, we're mixing reality, magical reality uh, and song all together to kind of weave this tale. Thank you. So Angelique, I know that um, besides, you know, that you are from Benin and, and this is a part of your history, I, I know there's a personal story behind um, why you felt, why you wanted to do this piece. And um, could you just, just tell us a little bit about how you got what was your um, your uh, motivation? I think that my motivation was um, the lack of knowledge about uh, our own history and uh, the the cliches that people have in their brain about what being a black person or an African person mean, meant. And um, also, as a human being, I was raised in a family where I didn't make any difference between people, basically. It doesn't matter to me which language you speak, what skin color you have, or what matters to me was the story I was taught when I was a kid. And in that story of my ancestor, the struggle that my family have been through being one of those rare families that stood against slavery and that are still today feeling the, the brunt of it, the fire of it and the resentment of it and the silence that goes with it. Because that's the deal. You keep quiet and you remember your family, most of them, the one that get through the crack, they just go and you have nothing to say or everybody goes. And, and also the beauty of the tradition that was still going on during those times. Life didn't stop. People, people look back to their, their gods and goddesses to find strength to fight the slave trade, to find, to keep the normalcy, to keep the humanity. And that's what I want, I want to try to tell the story. And also to link it for people in America and everywhere in the diaspora, for us to deep, 
dig in our memory to find stuff that have been told with that oral tradition that left with the slave and spread everywhere, there's still traces of it today. So we, we are setting this a, a, a stage where we can tell one another story in a way of moving forward and, and, and prevailing and being stronger. And um, Cheryl, so at one point, did you get involved with the project um, with Angela? She had no choice. I didn't give her the choice. <laughs> Tell us about your journey to the project. <laughs> Actually, um, Carrie, my husband, had worked with Angelique before uh, creating a, a beautiful portrait of her. And so he told me about her before I met her, although I knew of her. And um, we were in New York, uh, what was it, 2019? <laughs> and, um, met at BAM because uh, Angelique is very persuasive. And um, she she had come to Chicago and performed and told us about her project and um, recruited us to be part of the band. <laughs> and so we went to New York and, and joined forces. Um, it was uh, really just a, a, a freewheeling conversation that we had around the table because the project wasn't quite formed, but it really was a passionate idea of Angelique's and the conversation that we had, you know, with Angelique and Jean and um, Naima and Gabrielle was really engrossing uh, because uh, she shared so much of the folkways and history that was really compelling and also she was interested in telling the very complex story of slavery from an african's point of view and i was i was pleased that she talked about stereotypes or or just tropes that we repeat about uh slavery and the players the major players and the victims and all of this because she has a much more complicated um, view and that um, that's always challenging because we're comfortable with what we've been repeating but the challenge of finding out something new that might not have been what we anticipated is always is always expanding it, it really grows one to understand the challenges and and that was that was just like catnip. It was <laughs> it was too much to, to deny. And uh, I had been also years back. I had visited um, uh, Senegal, Goree Island, and um, I knew that there were stories there that I was I w had not known or hadn't heard from the Africans' point of view. And that was like in 70, I don't even know, 78 or something like that. So it was a long time ago. But no one ever talked about speaking for Africans on their side of it. Only Africans as victims, Africans as slaves. But here was an African who was going to talk on another level, and I couldn't stop. Uh, so I, I'm here as a moderator, but I'm also the costume designer. So I guess since we all just talked about when we joined the project, um, yeah, let me let me steal your moderator microphone. Okay. <laughs> so Mary Jane, could you please talk to us about how you got involved in this project? What drew you to the project? What are some things that you're playing with in terms of costume? Just. Just the floor is yours. You're, you're a good moderator. <laughs> um, well, as you guys know, and maybe the, some people in the audience know, I'm, I, I designed Angelique's costumes for her tours and for her special appearances. And, um, and I had the pleasure of going to Senegal with, with uh, Angelique, uh, shopping for fabrics in the market, which um, is like an unbelievable experience because the whole, market, <laughs> the whole market followed us around like she was the Pied Piper. And they kept tapping me on the shoulder and they go, 
Ange is that Angelique? Is that Angelique Kichu? Is that Mama Africa? And I'm like, yes. And I, they joined behind. And then they just kept joining, joining, joining behind. And we were doing like a, a conga line around the market by. <laughs> <laughs> The Pied Piper. You know, Angela, I, we share, I, you know, rich history of, of the West African fabrics and, um, and uh, my connection to the Yoruban um, culture is through Brazil. And I've worked with uh, the Orishas um, over, the, over the years in different projects. So, um, but I just want to say that it was not a given that I was going to be the d designer for this uh, show. I had to audition. <laughs> and I'm very happy that um, Cheryl um, Cheryl chose me to be uh, the costume designer for the show because it's such an exciting project. It's really the culmination of all the things I've done in, in these cultures for the last you know 20 years. It's just like the dream project for me. Um, so actually, it's a good time to ask this question of Angelique. Um, so while the story is African, um, the production is very international, and, and um, and to me, that makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, besides your talent, you're a bridge builder. And and what you said earlier about, you know, not seeing, you know, not judging people by by who they are and their, um, you know. Uh, so just tell me a little bit about how you decided to make this project international and and why. Because I believe deeply in my heart that this the story of slavery is all all of us is our story of all. It is still impacting our lives today in the policy that have been made. And I think that ignorance perpetuated the abuse. So I, the only way that I have to fight against hate, racism, finger pointing, and, and reducing people to to things that people can live with, other people can live with, is through arts. Art is stronger than anything else. I mean, you just look at one painting of Kerry James Marshall, and you go, what have took us so long to be in the museum? Why didn't the Black Beauty was in the museum at the first place from the beginning? So it takes some of us to be bold, to stand, to, to, to change this narrative that is it is a is a is a, a, a jacket an iron jacket that they built for us to fit in and nowhere to go nowhere to expand and no one to speak and i said every time you want to speak and you start talking about slavery i got this reaction all the time it was 400 years ago and i say yes buddy 400 years ago and who's still profiting for that not us and who's telling our story so for me it's always bringing people that have known nothing about this story to hear it from us differently. And we can discuss, we can not, we can sit and not be, not agree, it's okay with me. But as long as the discussion continues in respect of our, what we've been through and what we are going through and what we have to say and what we have to bring to the plate, I'm open for all discussion. It has to be international, we cannot, deal with this world in which we are living by still continuing compartmentalizing things. And compartmentalizing things, it allows abuse of rights of people, gives roots to racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and full art. Art for me is the only form, only way that I know how to speak to people, to tell people, hello, buddy, we are all human beings and sharing the same ecosystem in the same earth, period. I, I really, I would really like to piggyback on that because um, it makes me think of the present circumstances here in the States and the um, constant, the constant concern that if, if only people knew the facts about you know, the vaccine or the election, or the, if only they knew the right facts, then they would think differently. But the interesting thing that Angelique has hit on is that making an end run around facts, addressing the humanity, the human side of a story helps people, it disarms people actually, because everybody loves a story. All human beings, that doesn't matter the age, 
We always deal in stories. You know, I'm late. Why was I late? Well, you know, my alarm clock fell off the bed yesterday and I didn't know it wasn't working. I mean, we always have a story and yeah. people always are interested in stories. And what better way to get to the heart, the heart of things, the heart of people is to use stories. Mm -hmm. And we can make them as complicated as we want to, to show as much of the story as we can possibly show. Because that's, that's very disarming. People don't like, they like to listen to a story. Yeah. They do. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking um, while we were talking about, so, so Imaja is the, is the deity of, of the goddess of the water. And, um, and, using, and using the Orishas um, are important because it's a part of the African culture, but it also connects every, the whole African diaspora because, um, you know, Cuba, Brazil, many countries in Latin America, in um, America, in, in, uh, in the United States, um, many people have um, practice, practice or honor um, their ancestors, um, you know, your Ruben background. So um, I feel like that's also a very good vehicle for reaching for different people. Was, mm -hmm. was that intentional, um, Naima? And, and well, then there's a lot of bridges. Again, it is this, this idea, like mom is saying, that, that art, art, music, whichever medium, if it touches you, if it has that punctum, right, that that's undeniable. You can say, oh, I don't believe this. But if someone is in front of you with their humanity and their fullness as a person, you can't say, oh, I don't believe you exist, right? It's right there in, in front of you. And um, that there's that bridge between one person to another and between the dias all the different aspects of the diaspora whether it's Americans, Black Americans feeling distant from their African ancestors or Cuban or, you know, all these different ways in which arbitrarily we were all separated. Um, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you are, there's that humanity that's there. And I think there's, I think what Yamanja as our guide does, not only what you're saying, Mary Jane, which is very true and was, part of our process is connecting, you know, the Yoruba, pulling on all the Yoruba threads wherever they may have been spread throughout the world. But it's this trope that we know even in the West of there's the chorus, the Greek chorus, or there's there's a God coming and taking somebody under their, under their wing, you know, is that Artemis or is that Yamanja? You know, it's a, it's a format that we're all familiar with. And, and all these cultures, there is that everywhere of that, that benevolent God coming down and, and keeping an eye on things, or maybe a trickster God coming to mess things up, but that there's a, something about the format of the story as well that is a bridge as well. And, and same thing with the music itself, right? Ooh, that music that they've been composing, you can't help but just sway to the beat. You can't help but dance. And it really does that. It hooks you in and um, all these different aspects come together to, to connect really. And also there are, even in the story that um, Naima and Angelique have woven, there are characters that are bridge builders. They're, they're in two cultures. So th there's no monolithic, um, kind of personality they are connected one way or another through blood through parentage through uh, love it, it, it there is a connection and a, com a complication because of the connection that can't be denied that has to be worked through lived through negotiated and and we know that denial doesn't work <laughs> Denial doesn't work. Mm -mm. And that whole idea of just being one thing is impossible. It's as soon as you start scratching at it, it doesn't work. Even just being a human born, I don't care where you're from. You came from two people, from, from two people, two parents. That's two different families. That's two different humans. You know, everybody, whether they're mixed race in the standard sense, everybody's a mix of something. Mm -hmm. Everybody is. So 
there's always going to have to be bridges between mom and dad, between mom and mom, between dad and dad. There's always going to have to be a bridge. So why not make it a beautiful, singing, colorful bridge like our musical? I mean, I think that uh, all we're saying is, is so true. And that's what we have come, all of us that we have succeeded after that meeting in, in New York hmm. to tell this story. Hmm. I mean, at the beginning, it was not easy to get where we are because suddenly what happened is that we gave away all those structures that we have in our mind and let the complexity of every character be. And that's what we are not, we are not able to do in our daily life. We want things to be simple. You have to fit in this category. You have to fit in that one. A human being is a complex being. There's no way you can just reduce a human being to an idea. It's impossible. I was doing an interview. Uh, I was doing an interview last week that I was played, and I had a book come out of conversation in, uh, of my some interview, and I was explaining that my mother, uh, from her father's side, her ancestors are slave descendant that come back from Brazil. So my mom's maiden name is Fernando, okay? So here the lady wrote, read that book and then say, and suddenly my father also became, I mean, they said, you are descendant of slave. I say, absolutely. I take that on too. <laughs> because the, I am that too. I won't, I won't deny the paternal part of my, my mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, it's me. It's, I, I'm, as my daughter was saying, we are somehow mixed from the fact that we have been on this planet from the Chromion, the, I mean, the Neanderthal and all of those things, the mixture of it. I was, I was looking at it on TV and it's just amazing and you just go, hold on a minute. We've been through mix for so, so many centuries and we still here being stupidly racist. I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's so that's what's so fascinating about skip gates um program finding absolutely, your, I mean, absolutely. I, i'm always i'm always riveted you know people are finding out their families were slave owners or slaves or, or kings. kings did you see or that both <laughs> yeah and somebody was like oh yeah if you trace it back hundreds of years you're like descended from these kings i was like oh, oh yes yeah, like, man kings. I right, right. Yeah. right or people finding out that they're part black that they didn't know, you know, because no one in the family either knew or passed it down. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the discoveries, the epiphanies, and also how these stories really affect the the descendants, the people who are hearing about themselves. It's really it's really something compelling to see to watch, and sometimes disturbing because if you have tell, told yourself a story of not having any black blood, suddenly you facing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was one um, person, I can't remember who it was, but he didn't know that he had family he lost in the Holocaust. No one had ever told him. And I mean, that's not that long ago. Wow, yeah. But he's, he's sitting there hearing wow. that he's lost not, not a few people in the Holocaust. It floored him, and it was something to see, you know. Or black people find out they're part Jewish, you know. Just it's just people, people. Even in the play, in a, the the figure, the Orisha Yemanya Aimanja, she has several names. Mm -hmm. She is also syncretized in the, in the Catholic religion with the Virgin Mary. Yep. And so people who are devotees or to the religion and also Catholics can and have worshiped the same deity, whether they knew it or not. And that was, you know, an ingenious decision of the, the, the slaves in Brazil to name the Orisha, the Catholic saints names, so mm -hmm. that they can still honor them and praise them and never lose. Never yeah, lose, yeah, never yeah. lose. So the you know the human heart is just fascinating. Yep, and that's then that's what it is. The human heart, knowing it needs to be fed, and figuring out a way to feed it. It's true, and I think as you say, Yemanja is the Virgin Mary, 
And me, it brings me back to the Catholic religion with mm. which I was raised. <laughs> the, the things that I, thought I was taught is that we've been created at the image of God. Mm -hmm. For me, since I was a kid, it's always a question I ask. Is God black, white, yellow, red? And my mom would say, he's all of that. Oh. She, she said that? <laughs> she said that? There she is. Yeah, she said, God is all of that. There she is. There's, yeah, Yemanja is right there. As you thought. have it. She looks, very much like a virgin. she looks very much like a Virgin Mary, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with those palms open. When you go to the botanicas, you see all the different, all the different statuettes of for Yemanja, Aymanja. They mm -hmm. they stand in for the Virgin Mary as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yemanja is the Yorubas, and the font they call it Mami Wata. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. It's the same. The mother of the water. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> that's just what it is. So I'm going to move away for a minute from the themes to the process. So I just wanted to ask um, each of you about um, the, the, the work and process and how the elements are coming together. Um, so Angelique, what was the first song that you wrote for? Hmm. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. I mean, it's for me, it's difficult. It's the same question they asked me when I, I release an album, choose your favorite song. I don't know which one is my favorite song. I don't even know in which order thing comes. Now, even my remember, I mean, we just start putting idea down there and mm -hmm. we come back as the script was going along. Some song has been changing in lyrics and in sizes because this, when we start writing the song, we're just putting them there as a guide, as an idea, thinking about, we, have, we even talk about that with uh, Cheryl when we met the first time which instrument should be with this character and so on and so forth. So basically the music that, that is there has been informed by the writing of all the play. So we were flexible enough to piece it together. It's like a Ruby cube. And, and then you put it in mm -hmm. And then you, you, that's, for me, that's the best way to work because if you, what I always avoid putting myself in when I'm creating is putting myself in a corner where I can't get out of. That if this song is like that, and my mind is always that, it makes no room for somebody else to come in or to something to happen to that song to open it up. Well, so the it's, process, it's, just, the, it's the same really, thing that is that is happening in with the play that we do. Yeah, it was a really interesting um, process. Definitely it was also the first time for me working in this setting with my parents. So there was part of it that was, you know, learning in some ways it was good because we've had a lifetime of communicating that we could use as a foundation but it was a, a really interestingly i thought a, a great learning process for for all of us where you know i had so much to learn in terms of music i'd send lyrics and uh, or revise lyrics and having then um my 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 parents who both wrote it together come back and say well actually this word kind of ends on a high you know, kind of a high sound, right? But that's not gonna work with the melody we have. So we need another word that has a different sound. I'm like, what? You know, and then I, they would send me songs and all of a sudden there'd be like this gorgeous, like second person singing in the back. And I'm like, there's nobody else on stage. Like who's gonna, <laughs> who's gonna sing this? You know, you, you have to think about who's on stage to do what. So it's been kind of a nice and fun process figuring out, learning about each other's sides of it and, and kind of being in, in dialogue. And then of course, having Cheryl looped into the dialogue uh, as kind of a, the, you know, as she's the captain of this ship saying, hmm, this song should have us going a little bit more starboard, but it's going, it's not going fast enough. So then we we come go back and speed up the song or or cut some of the lyrics so we get to the heart faster. So it's been kind of like, you know, almost like carving a statue, a couple that's how I like that's together. how I like to work. Because if I work with people, and you know this, Mary, Mary Jane, and Cheryl is learning that from me. When I work with people, I don't tell them what to do. If I come to you is because I trust that you're gonna bring you in it. And you're gonna help me tell this story in the way that it will touch you and touch other people. 
And as even if for my music, all my collaboration that I've done throughout the year, is always been at the service of the song. Also, we're always looking at, well, let's think about this song as a child. How, what kind of upbringing we gotta give to this child? And that's what, that's what I do all the time. I'm always thinking about when I'm not there, when people li I listen to my music in the intimacy, I just don't want them to feel awkward. I don't want them to feel angry. I don't, so I'm always following my instinct and my inspiration and opening my, myself. It's every song of, my, of me is a part of my soul that I'm giving away all the time. So I wanted this process to be the same when we were writing and working with Naima and Cheryl to hear the feedback, you know? Because when you're doing something, and that's why I, Naima, I mean, we let, we let her listen to stuff. Because when you're doing something and you're listening, you're listening, you get, it's like you're in an eco, eco chamber and you, you need to get out of there. You need to get out of that. And then people are gonna say, hold on, that ain't working. So this is what we're gonna do. And that's how we work in the song. And also with Naima and Cheryl, the script all the way was, I mean, it was like, I was, I was seeing their work. It was like writing a song, this verse don't work. This chorus don't work. This don't, and it just piecing things together. There's no- It's uh, characters. We need to cut a character being like- oh Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's not like we, we, we have any, everything set up to be like that. No, if it was like that, we won't be nowhere today. But Cheryl, you have a, you, you know, you have the, the spoken word, the song and the visual to deal with as the, as the director. <laughs> Tell us about how that, where, where do you, how do you She shift? had no choice, she had no choice. <laughs> well, you know, for me, um, as an actor, uh, the story is everything. And it has all of the answers. I say that all the time. I say it when I direct and I say it when I teach. The story has everything, all the answers in it. The, pro the, the, the task before me as an actor is to find the answers in that text. And if the story is good, see where the airtight, then all those answers can be found. And they might not be found right away, but that's my job as an actor, as a director, as another creative, as one of the um, creatives in, in the project, to find the answers. And they are there. And, and things don't reveal themselves right away. It takes time to understand. When we first met in Brooklyn at BAM, we only met, I think, what, two days. And that first day, at the end of the day, I said to Naima, you think you can write something for tomorrow? I know it was short. It was short notice. But she did come back the next day with, with a, a skeleton with a, a, a beginning that was really quite rich. I mean, we, we massaged it, but she brought us something to work with mm -hmm. and, and, and it generated important and fruitful conversations. And we had a sense when I left, I had a sense that we were going to find something because she was on a path and we were turning also to Angelique for information for guidance for comments and here and comes Oro, and she was always it, full of them so that made it even richer oh you but, remember Cheryl? that first day when oro come in oro <laughs> yes. and then <laughs> carrie start playing oro i'm like gee this gotta be in the play <laughs> so when carrie was reading oro because we didn't have any actors we were just around the table carrie was reading it and and he caught fire and angelique loved that so we knew that character had to be present and Oro for and that really made the story richer and that relationship between mm -hmm. Yemanja and Oro is an important one as well. So yeah, Oro is the wind, is the an, another Orisha who's the wind Orisha, and he does kind of like swift retribution and justice. <laughs> and aggressive. And very yeah. vi violent. Very you know. And but trying to get on me, huh? Eh? <laughs> but that was what was so wonderful. Uh, Naima came right away with i think it was about five pages of text mm -hmm, i think so and it, i i was really impressed and pleased and that kind of launched us 
And during, during COVID, during the hard part of the pandemic, we were still working on text. We had reads with professional actors, which gave us even more information and helped us go back to the drawing board and figure out, you know, we could lose this character or we can double up these characters and consolidate the, the cast, or we don't really need this scene. We've heard it and we're familiar with it, but, I don't, but we don't think we need it. Or having actors, you know, that's, that's the thing too, like Cheryl is saying, as actors, we have to follow the path of our character. So then having someone say, I'm not sure why my character did this, then is really helpful to say, oh yeah, maybe that arc of this particular character could be a little bit more clear here. You know, having that kind of focus on all the individual characters, you know, there's always so many elements. And as we're moving more and more forward, thinking about, for me, it's nice, takes a weight off of my shoulders in terms of writing to, to talk with Cheryl and, and think about the set. What, how much of the story can be told by the set? How much of the story can be told by a costume? I don't need to write a line where people say, ooh, watch out for Oro. If, if Mary Jane has a costume that all of a sudden Oro walks in and you immediately think, ooh, watch out for this guy. You know, that there's, that there's so many storytelling elements that, that don't have to be written or spoken. There can be some music played that tells us everything. There can be a projection, there can be light, that there's all these different elements coming together to, to tell that same story. And it's not, um, it's not a single thing, it's a real collaborative effort. So again, going back to our, our theme buzzword of the day, bridges, right? That it really is not only a bridge between the audience and us, but between all of the different creatives, bridging all of our different departments to come together and, and make this. And the readings were really helpful in, in another way. The actors, if an actor keeps having a problem with a particular part of the text, it means we really need to look at that. Either mm -hmm. something's off with the wording or the, the language or something, or some connection isn't being made because the actors can't, can't communicate what they don't understand. And so that allowed us to, to look at trouble spots and to finesse them or uh, expand on them or make a bridge between one idea to another that wasn't there. And once we get a tight enough script, the, we understand that the lyrics are also telling part of the story. And so right now we're focusing now more on the music where we were focusing on the text prior. Now we're really giving the language of the music um, more scrutiny. And it's been exciting because we've got technicians for that. We've got creatives who make their living with music. Our music director, Daryl, Archibald is amazing. And, you know, he's kind of always the same way, you know, we've been thinking about character arc. He'll be like, well, what's the arc of this song? You know, where's the beginning, middle and end? What's the journey that we go on and that they go on in the song and being like, ooh, hmm. You know, he's asking us the questions that guide us. Yeah, people being so, so good at what they do. And then we come together and that being so helpful. And yeah. also Angelique, and Jean have a, a, a wealth of knowledge about instrumentation, about musicians, about the craft and the skill of shaping music that I don't have. I enjoy it, but I don't know how it gets made. I'm not in the, you know, <laughs> in the kitchen with the sausage making, but they know. And Naima can ask a question, I can, and they have answers, technical answers that can help us understand what we are doing and what we're not doing, what we need to do. So it's, it's very much a collaboration, very much. I yeah, mean, I uh, what is the name of the guy, Daryl? Mm -hmm. Daryl, uh -huh. the, thing, the thing also, when you're doing music with people that have already worked in theater, that understand music, it makes it easier for us to speak with them. Uh -huh. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Because they understand a song being performed on stage without being in Broadway and a song that's going to be in the play. 
so different than a concert. So when we start talking with him, it becomes clear because the question he asked allowed us to put the space in the music or leave room for him to do every arrangement that will allow that song to exist in the play. And that is so, and, and you need people with, with also with humility that understand that this is a new way of doing things, that we are creating something us together. And whatever it is, if it becomes successful, we might be the only the first people that have done this. And that is what I, I, I when we started this, it was my dream from, from the beginning to come up with a way of telling story the way I used to hear the story, sitting down on the lap of my grandmother, asking millions of questions when she go, just shut up, let me finish my story. I'm gonna go, yeah, but before you continue, what you said before, I don't even understand it. Can you tell me before we move on? And then she go, oh, you are not listening. I say, no, grandma, I'm sitting right here, I'm listening. But that character you call, he's no longer there, but you're talking about it now. And then she's gonna go, I told you before, that that character is gonna come later. And I know she said that, but I just wanna hear it again. So Naomi, you, you, you brought up the sets. So um, Cheryl, I'd love to look at the set, uh, our, our, uh, our model. And um, if you just tell us when did Carrie start to conceive, at what point did he start to conceive of the, the set as it is now and some of the elements? And Well, Carrie, um when he agreed to design the set began to do a good deal of research before he made a stroke on a piece of paper and um he was researching all kinds of things i didn't know that he was looking at he was looking at the famous uh, tiles the blue tiles in portugal for in for for inspiration in creating the home of, or the place of the slave trader who has Brazilian roots. I mean, so he's looking at Benin sculpture to incorporate that in the village that he created. He's looking at <laughs> the kinds of trees that grow in Benin to understand the shape and how he's going to incorporate the shape in the set. So um, he set about researching deeply in a lot of directions before he drew anything. And then he created a set that employs uh, an ancient Greek um, set piece called a periactoi, which is a three-sided, a triangular piece that turns and changes locale. And I've seen it and I've used it in a production before, but it's not often used, but it was often used in earlier times in Renaissance theater um, because it meant that you could have three sets for the price of one. And it was economical and only needed people to change the side of the, of the periactoid. So he decided to incorporate periactoids. Now, his set, just like the text, went through different iterations. Because once he showed me what he was working with, I knew the text that Naima and I had come to. I think we're working on draft 12. And <laughs> are you counting? Draft 12, draft 20, <laughs> draft who knows? I said, you know, Carrie, this won't work. I need this. This won't work. We have to go there. And so we had <laughs> Boy, Carrie. a whole day where Carrie and I comb through the play scene by scene. It's a knock down, drag out day, but we had to do it <laughs> because the set is where the actors and the projectionist and mm. the lighting and the, every, every element of the play will have to live. And with the understanding that the set would be portable to go from one venue to a neck to another. So I'll, I'll turn the, uh, my laptop so you can see what he came up with 
Is this good? Oh my God. So the set has three different locales. The village is stage right. Um, it has, this is a sculpture which you can't see because uh, he hasn't, he only put a placeholder here. But this is a sculpture. This is the set piece that will be the village. Mm -hmm. And there's a piece that fell down here. I, I knock things down, but so we have the e exits and entrances for the actors. And this will be one around here, mm -hmm. around here and around here. Yeah. The center area upstage is the um, projection screen, which is a huge part of the um, upstage area. And in front of it is two of the two periactoi that we um, ended up with. I think Carrie started out with four, but it took two, just way too much space. And then we have the periactoi, which open, wow. reveal, yay my ya. And of course, lights and sound will be working with us, but she has this playing area here. The periactoi also can be changed to create stage, the le stage left area for the slaver character, um, DeSalta. Mm -hmm. And so we have entrances here. This is a gate that opens. I don't want to tear it up, but this is a gate that opens and we have entrances here. And then the periactoi changes again to create the village home of um, Adefola and um, Loco. And so we get a chance to switch locales by only turning these pieces that can move. Wow. Um, and the musicians will be downstage here on this little platform. Mm -hmm. We just have these two things here, but they're yeah. just there to let us know that the musicians will be part, musicians will be part of the presentation. And these are other characters. I'm just, I just got them down here, but they're not, they're just there. This is how I figured out the blocking. Mm -hmm. Carrie created, gave me these little figures and put little buttons on the bottom so they wouldn't fall down. Mm -hmm. So that I could figure out <laughs> where, <laughs> where the characters were going and where they, where they, where they had to disappear. But um, this is what we've been working with. And this Ooh, is going to be beautiful. After we got the, you know, an understanding of the text. So that's where we are. Yeah, it was a great day when, <laughs> Cheryl, when you acted out the, uh, the whole show with the little figures. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I really do. But it love really it. made the, you know, it, it gave me so much of a better understanding of, of, of the whole play. And for me as a costume designer, like what these bodies, where they were going, what they were doing. And, um, you know, that was, a, that, was a, that was a great, uh, great session that we had. <laughs> yes. And it was very helpful when, you know, the light lighting is asking questions. And when the projectionist is asking questions, well, when Yemanja is revealed, what happens? And I say, well, this can go up there and she can come downstage. And Lights said, I can create something just around her. Because in the play, Yemanja goes behind the veil and in front of the veil. And instead of having a physical veil, the lighting designer said, we can make a veil around her wherever she goes. So that means when Yemanja's over here talking to um, Oro, they can be behind the veil, but they're lit in such a way that they're not here. They're not in DeSalta's place. They're not in the village. They're in their own space behind the veil. And yeah. you know, we went through, well, do they climb up onto a platform that's behind? <laughs> 
I ain't climbing nowhere. Don't I break right. that up? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just, yeah, we said, no, let's make it as simple as possible because the audience, the audience loves to have magic. And they like to see you make magic right in front of them. It's one thing to bring a veil out, but it's another thing to make them see the veil you didn't bring out. Mm -hmm. To create a veil with something else they didn't think of. And so that's what where we are. And our conversations about characters helped me understand um, our conversations, Mary Jane, about costumes and also about props, which, which you know, you've been talking about as well. Cheryl is, Cheryl is incredible. You're, you're incredible to work with because you have so many ideas and, and you really are a magician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so that makes me the magician's assistant. <laughs> I have to figure out how to pull Hopefully the rabbit. You won't get so sawed in half. How I'm going to make that hat that the rabbit's going to come out of. <laughs> you, oh, and you have a couple of hats. Not only do I ask you for it, you give it, you give it multiple, multiple times. Yeah. But it's interesting because, you know, like Carrie, I did a lot of research initially and I was looking to have a, a, you know, a historical, you know, and also what I knew, the references that I knew from Brazil and, mm -hmm. um, and from West Africa. But, um, but you, you know, Cheryl, you you push for magic and that's something that's, you know, so it really is very exciting because it's like, you can do all the research you want and you can have ideas about what things look like, but then like to, you know, what's so different about theater than anything else is that, you know, these illusions that you're creating. And, and I think, you know, you guys have used the word, I mean, maybe not today, but in, in things that we've written about magical reality and these, um, you know, and then, just to explain um, to the audience, when we talk about the veil, it's because, you know, we're talking about the gods, you know, like the equivalent of say the, you know, the gods on Olympus and the, and the humans on the, on, on the, on the ground. So having to, you know, trying to create that, um, you know, the illusion, but, but, you know, meeting the, um, yeah, meeting the um, Devon and, um, and uh, Kathy, you know, the lighting designers and the, and the, uh, projection and production designers, you know, has been so revealing because it's like the things you can do, you know, like, like the movement, I can create movement in the fabric, but I don't even have to because, you know, Devante can, can create it um, with, with a projection, you know. Right. What? When, when she has <laughs> fabric, when she fabric, fabric like this, which is almost a hologram kind of fabric. Yeah, it is. This, this is something so wonderful for lights to play with. I mean, this is just one of the ideas, the samples that that um, Mary Jane has compiled, just not only with sketches, but with uh, fabric samples. And so she explains what she's doing and why she's doing it and the quality of the fabric. You know, this this moves or this has movement like water or waves, or this is a lacy light fabric that can go over something else and give you more dimensions than just a, a dress. Capes. Ooh, talk about magic. Aha, uh -huh, talk about magic. <laughs> Fabric that was in the earlier uh, sample. Uh, research, <laughs> research, which gives us images of earlier times that really are jumping off points, right? Here's another sample of a garment. And it's the movement, it's the fans that were important. So Mary Jane did the, all that research and came up with this book of costume costumes that has been really helpful and very rich. So that's the kind of magician I'm working with. <laughs> I see that. Yeah, well, I can't wait to start wearing those clothes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, of course, you know, yeah. yeah. for me, right? Yeah, I was about to say, Angelique, unfortunately, I have to make some other people the clothes, too. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm boring. What about the designers? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I want it all for me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the four of you. Oh, the three of you. Sorry, I'm the fourth. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> for joining us today. Um, I know that um, you know it's a dream of Guild Hall that um, maybe eventually the, they're redoing their theater and they're hoping the production maybe can come out here in the in the future. Um, and um, so uh, the audience will be looking forward to seeing it in person. Um, so again, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having us, and we're looking forward to make bring this to life. Yeah. <laughs>